What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which helps service professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, coaches, consultants create additional revenue streams and stop just trading time for dollars. We hold you accountable to achieve your biggest goals with a step-by-step roadmap. Rise 25 is run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran. It is application only. Today, I am very excited. We have Paul Bigham, one of the top direct response marketers. He's founder of Bigham Agency. Summed up in a nutshell, Paul helps make it easy for people to feed the hungry, house the homeless, clothe the naked, and heal the sick. Paul, that's no small feat. Brian Kurtz introduced Paul at a VIP Titan dinner as the largest non-Jewish contributor to the state of Israel. He's raised over $1 billion for the state of Israel through direct mail, which he's going to talk about. And one company they work with was quoted as saying, during our 15-year association, the Bigham Agency has helped grow our annual budget from $4 million to $90 million a year in charitable support. Fun fact about Paul is he designs his own cowboy boots and he saw Jimi Hendrix live. Paul, thanks for joining me. Well, great. Pleased to be here. Thank you. So how much direct mail pieces do you send per month now or per year? Uh, let's see. Per month, we do a little over 2 million pieces per month. Oh. And um, then another 12 million in acquisition. Uh, I have a six million dollar stamp bill. Uh, that I pay for, so. <laughs> they love you over there. They do. They do. They do. What's exciting lately that you're sending out? If you can talk about it. Yeah, we've got uh, one thing we're really working on right now with the, the um, end of the winter coming through is the Holocaust survivors. Hmm. We do a lot of work in the former Soviet Union. I want to say we, the organization that we support, we help raise funds for. And they are working on, with Holocaust Remembrance Day coming up, not too, too far away, is to work on a campaign that not only remembers those who perished during the Holocaust, but to help those who were still alive who suffered through the Holocaust. Uh, and that's one of the, the, the big things we do. I've been over to Ukraine twice, uh, flew into Kiev, and then we got in vans and drove three hours out into the countryside into the little shtetls uh, means it's the German uh, expression for a little small village and they really are small villages uh, some of the roads that we went on um, it would they were so far back and so ice packed it would take an hour to go about four miles wow. I mean it's just rut after rut after rut you have to stop and go around them maybe five ten miles an hour that you would get there so that's how remote how isolated they are and how difficult it is for them to get food, clothing, and shelter, or medicine. And again, most of these people are upper 80s, uh, mid 90s. Uh, they live alone, they're by themselves, horrible stories. Just, what were you doing there? Uh, we were getting research, as we would call it. We were going in, meeting the individual people. Most of them are, are women. Uh, most of the men didn't survive uh, through this age. And so we would go and talk to them, find out what their story was like, and uh, get their expressions. We had an interpreter. Uh, with us and then we get still photographs and then some video and then we bring that back and put that into the appeal packages mm -hmm. that we send out the appeal letters or the newsletters the annual reports the calendars different m means of getting the message out to to the constituency of the organization that we're helping and it helps them to it helps the donors to identify with who they're helping well, so were those people holocaust survivors yeah they were, they, were. Uh, they were all holocaust survivors and uh, i'll just do a couple of of the the stories yeah give, talk about a couple of the stories yeah to give you the depth of, of what they went through and again these are 90 plus or minus i think 88 is the youngest that i've seen wow. 96 or so so they're very hardy most of them uh, they're all jewish uh, ukrainian jewish or russian jewish usually five two ish maybe five two five three 
somewhat frail, but have lived a long, long time. Uh, one in particular, I remember saying that she was, uh, as the, the Nazis came into her little village, again, way out in the middle of nowhere, came into her village that they grabbed her and grabbed her, her mother and her dad, and they uh, put the mother and the dad over into a line and eventually put them into a cart and eventually into a train, took them off to a prison camp. And the, one of the guards took her and just pushed her into the snow and said, don't get up. And so she lay there wondering what the heck was happening to her parents as they were being carted off and all these guys with guns and it's cold and, and so mm. forth. And as soon as she could, she got up and ran off into the forest and she lived in the woods for three years. Holy I mean, cow. These are like seven, eight, nine, ten year olds. Uh, she was seven, eight, nine or ten at the time. Seven, eight, nine or ten. Wow. And then one other who, the only way she survived is that she fell under the dead body of her mother and her father mm. and waited till the Nazis had moved on off. And then she got up and ran off in, in the night. So if you can imagine, number one, seeing Can't even imagine. Yeah. father being killed in front of you and then falling under them and having their dead bodies on you until these horrible creatures, horrible people left, and you get up and you run off to, to, to what? Some kind of a safety of living in the Ukrainian winter and woods for a while. That is absolutely, I can't, it's, it's not conceivable. It, um, what are they, what would they tell you? Like after those stories, what are they like now? What are some of the things that they conveyed to you when you were talking with them? Well, at, mostly they're they're lonely. Uh, they, they're they're still they're Jew. They're still Jewish, and they're still in Ukraine. And the Jews are still not liked in Ukraine in that whole area over there. So they're very isolated. Uh, no family to support them. No safety net. The closest thing they have is they'll have a Jewish worker come out once a month and just kind of check on them. So they're very very lonely, and they just talk as fast as they can talk, talk and cry and go through the stories and very animated and mm. we're we're um, there ought to be a better way to say it um, we're, we're like celebrity to them and the fact that we came that we're from You're America, documenting it yeah from America number one we came to see them number two they haven't seen anybody in a month number three and they just really um, are, are absorbing our being there and just talk as fast as they can talk what was it like for you personally it's it's uh, it's draining it's just very, very emotional. It, you know, you're on duty, you're on point, you're, you're wanting to get the stories, you're wanting to get the accuracy so that you can go back and relay these stories to the people in, in America and actually around the world, but primarily in America who care about Holocaust survivors. So you want to get that information down and you have a translator and the translator that speaks a little bit of, uh, of Ukrainian, a little Russian and a little Yiddish and the, the survivor speaks a little bit of each of those and so you have Three languages coming into three languages. Trying to <laughs> so, so is it going on? Is someone interpreting it to you in English, or are they doing that after the fact? Or it, it's almost simultaneous. It is. And then I'm asking questions, and I'll say, um, so what did she do once she once the guards left? And then the interpreter would do that, and then the person would answer back and back to there and say, you know, she waited until the dark, got up and ran off, and into the woods and so we were you know, just going trying to be sensitive I mean these are very difficult stories very hard memories for right. them to come back to go through that so being sensitive about the caring of the individual um, it, you know it's bringing up old wounds to for do sure. that and try to do that at the same time to get the information so we can come back and tell the donors so that the donors will say yes I want to help those individuals over there so we, we try to make it easy for people to do what they want to do try to make it easy for donors yeah. to do what they want to do so we bring back stories about people that they want to help yeah. so Paul where are those videos where do they are they do you keep them somewhere or are they just audio recordings what's the... their their videos and uh, they're actually on the website of the yeah. international, uh, the ifcj.org oh. I is international F is in fellowship C is in Christian J is in Jew or Jews, ifcj.org, hmm. and uh, we'll also use them for uh, 2830 uh, infomercials that'll go on and, and relay the information about what's going on in, in these really hard-pressed areas. And I mean, we're, we're over there, and I've got my, uh, as I like to call it, my Michelin coat on, my, my heavy Land's End coat, and right. gloves and boots and everything, and I'm buckled up, you know, with everything. And these little ladies are sitting there in these uh, just shacks 
I mean, some of them have open gaps in between the, the wood. Yeah. Uh, one of them was wrapped with um, like bamboo sheaves that was on the outside. Yeah. I mean, you can see your breath inside. And they don't have central air. They don't have central heat. Uh, if they have a little little pot belly stove, they can usually burn one or two sticks of wood a day is all that they have yeah. to keep warm. And it's minus 15, sometimes minus 50. Jeez. When we were there, it was minus 7 to minus 15. How do they even survive that? I mean, they survived horrible things, right? How are they surviving that at age 80s and 90s? And, like, you and I would go, and I would probably within a day be need to just go in some kind of warm, warm place. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a great question. And, and I look at them and I don't have a, an answer other than they're just hardy. Uh, I mean, they're bundled up with every possible rag, cloth, newspaper. I mean, they're, they're wrapped up as much as they can. Right. One little lady would get up on top, uh, it wasn't a pot belly stove. It was kind of, it looked like a little igloo. It was built in. A, it was it was originally built that way into our house. And these these homes were built back in the 30s, not, uh, 1930s. Right, uh, right. 1930, 19, probably even some 1920. And she would get up there and just lay on that that oven or that stove, and that's how she stayed warm. They just bundle up. I mean, they have to go outside to go to the bathroom, or if they don't, then they can't take it outside. It snows up. It blocks the doors. Uh, the icy paths are out to their well if they have well they don't have running water either so they've got to bring enough water in to last them between snow to snow and it's very slick we fell down i didn't fall down but one of the i almost fell down but uh the, my companion uh, phil who was with me he did slip and you know these yeah. you fall out there and you break it yeah hip. i mean if they get sick what happens i mean they just die out there pretty much they just die. yeah basically how does that change your perspective coming back? You know, like everyone's thinking, well, my cell phone's not working fast enough or my internet. And then you go and you see this going on <laughs> in this remote area in the Ukraine. How does that affect you and the kind of lessons you bring back to your, your family? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it makes me, certainly makes you more appreciative. Uh, and it makes you less, uh, less eye focus. You know, the world revolves around me. Well, you see that and well, maybe it doesn't as much as I thought it did. And, um, it makes it more, um, it gives me more reason to do what I do. Uh, the, the thing that the, the people ask me what sort of drives me to do this or where, where's my encouragement, where's my stimulus. And the thing I don't want to do is when I get to heaven is to find some little girl or some little uh, boy or some Holocaust survivor who says, you know, Paul, if you just worked a little bit harder, and a little bit smarter, mm -hmm. I had one more day of food to eat. That's something right. I don't have happened. So, uh, it, it's, it's sort of like the ending of Schindler's List in a way. I don't know if you remember that that movie, but that's yeah. pe pretty much kind of what happened to him at the end of the movie. And I don't know how much was, was real life and how much wasn't, but you know, that's what he was thinking. If I just sold one more thing, I would have saved one more life type yeah. of. Yeah, very, very much. And I, I really have that thought of. Uh, uh, I, and, and really, to reverse around the positive, when I get to heaven and I do see these people, I want them to say, thank you for working as hard as you did, for knowing as much as you know, learning as much as you've learned from other great people like Brian Kurtz that you mentioned and other people, so that they did have one more day of comfort, one more day less of, of misery. So those, yeah. that's my perspective. Thank you for sharing that. Paul, and, and we're going to go into how this applies to actually okay. you know, generating them the money that they can live. But I, I want to ask, what does, so what does the IFCJ provide for the people or in general? They, they are a funding organization so that uh, a person in America who wants to help has a way to send uh, aid over there. You, obviously, you can't send a peanut butter sandwich or a block of cheese or uh, a jar of medicine or something, you know, a, a vial of medicine over there. So you need a vehicle. You need a, need a uh, an avenue to do that. So the fellowship, International Fellowship of Christians and Jews, the fellowship as we call it, they will collect the money from, receive the money from donors in the states or in the world, and then they send it over to like the JDC, the Jewish Distribution uh, Committee, or some of the other Jewish organizations who have workers out in the field, and then they in turn will take the food, the medicine, check on to them. If they're, if they can get them to a doctor, then they'll they'll put them in a van and take them in. 
Mm-hmm. So we're we're really the channelers and the funders, the processors mm-hmm. of um, again making it easy for donors to do what they want to do. Yeah, yeah. So people just think, oh yeah, they're sending out a direct mail piece. They don't realize you're going into these villages and actually accumulating the stories and telling those stories. So so what happens after when you come back and you have this this these rich stories? Um, what do you do with them and what does that look like as far as what you're sending out? Yeah, then it, it goes into the direct response mode and it's very much uh, t- to take it out of the, the deep personal um, arena of these really heartbroken people and put it over into the, the marketing, advertising, merchandising, uh, direct response part, you know, which is what makes it work so that they do have one more day of hope and one last day of misery on that. Right. And it follows the, the principles and the precepts of marketing. You, know, you still have a consumer that you're dealing with. You still have buyer remorse, you have donor remorse, just like you have buyer remorse on that. You want to um, make sure that you're confirming what someone has done. Uh, everybody wants to be acknowledged and appreciated. It's nothing different than buying a car or buying a loaf of bread or that the process is not, not any different from right, that. Right. Is uh, how you communicate the message, how you tell it well, uh, stories well t- told, and communicate that interest. We never, we never rely on guilt. We never rely on pressure. Uh, it, it actually comes. If you want me to go a little further, yeah, it comes goes really, deep as humanly possible. Yeah. Okay. yeah, it really comes out of First and Second Corinthians eight and nine, and it really based on three principles: is that a God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, there's a Second Corinthians eight, uh, eight seven, I believe it is. It says that. Two, give from what you have and not from what you don't have. So if you have it, you want to give it, then that's two of the three. And then the third thing is give out of a joy of giving. Some people say out of, out of an obligation. I prefer to say it's a, it's a privilege and, a, and an honor to, to give. So um, if you enjoy giving, if you have something to give, and um, it's something you feel like fulfills what you're doing, then, then that's, we make that possible. Yeah. We, we communicate the stories, we do it through direct mail again, we write the letters, we send it out, we do segmentation, figure out who needs to receive, what they need to receive. We do uh, third class windows for the, the, the less engaged people so that we have lower cost involved into it. Those who are more engaged. Talk thousand. about that for a second. So uh, what do you mean by that for someone who doesn't know the third class windows? Good. Yeah. Um, we, we segment just, just like any other marketing firm would segment out their buyers, we segment out the donors. Uh, basically eight segments, uh, 2,500 who have given cumulative 2,500 in a year. Uh, those who have given 1,000 to 2,499. And we're going to talk about how all this offline stuff does apply to online because if people aren't segmenting, there's, mm-hmm. a, there's a lot of you know, um, the messaging is, is much different and packaging in this case is much different. So anyway, yeah. so go on. You, there's, there's a number of segments. Yeah, so do, do the segments and then that determines uh, who gets which package. And we do two basic packages. One is a, a, a nonprofit organization stamp. We call it third class, but, but it's really a nonprofit stamp. Right. And third class sounds worse. Third, third, it's, it's <laughs> like you're it's a third a class. You're segmented into third class. No. Yeah. Yeah, the th- third class stamp. So it, it's a it's a window. It's usually a left window. Uh, it's a two way match. Uh, the letter will be a dear friend letter. The reply device will have a personalization, dear John Q sample, and um, usually we've got. Sometimes it's a one way. Uh, it's a one way match. It, it just has one one identification in there, and then sometimes we'll have an extra device in there as well. Has like some what do you mean? Of, um, we'll do like a certificate that will be personalized. Mm-hmm. So that'll be that's another personalization. The reply device is usually the driver that goes inside the window that, that drives the package, and that would be typically ninety nine dollars and down a year is where. And we've done this through testing uh, to figure out where the the break even is to be good stewards of the funds that we have, and uh, that's where we get our best returns. And then hundred plus, we'll do a closed face window. Uh, excuse me, a closed face three way match package. What's a three-way match? So it's a, the outside carrier is personalized John Q. Sample. Oh. The letter uh, says John Q. Sample or mm. Bill and Betty Smith or you know whatever it is. More personalization. The personalization. And then the reply device will have that same Bill and Betty Smith on there as well. So you've got those three things that either machine or, or hand work has to put together. 
and then we will do sometimes an affinity group or a club uh, that, that we would have on that. And uh, the letters will go, depending on their, the rise, the, the, higher, the more frequently they give and the higher amount they give, the softer the ask will be, the less frequency, the lower amount, the more direct the ask will be in there. Mm-hmm. Not a guilt, not a push, but there is an ask. Yeah. Uh, again, if you don't have a call to action, that's the ask. Right. What's an example of an ask? That like a soft ask versus a hard ask or direct ask. Uh, uh, a soft ask would be, uh, Jeremy. You know, is one of our more faithful donors who have given frequently on a basis. If you feel like this is a good time, prayerfully consider to giving a gift that God provides. And here's another opportunity you may want to help Leah uh, this month. Mm. Something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then a, a sort of a moderate ask would be. Uh, These people Jeremy, are dying. Give something. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> we, we don't. I'll we'll use that in the lapse reactivation package. Uh, no, we don't. We don't. Um, but but a, a moderate ask would be your gift of $25 will provide one food box for a, an elderly Holocaust survivor uh, in the, who is snowed in in, um, in the villages of Ukraine. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Uh, so, so what? Um, how specific does it get with the kind? Con- does it actually tell specific stories in mm-hmm. the? Yeah. Yeah. No, well, the story that, that I, the two stories I mentioned to you, we've used both of those stories. We'll change the names, and then we'll change the photographs. Uh, some of them actually are still in danger from people who would want to come and get, uh, cause them harm. Really? Yeah, they really do. They really are, and they, they really are in that situation. So, um, you know, the person is Olga. Uh, which is a very common name in that area, then we might change it to uh, Leia, uh, which which is a good... Uh, I, I, I laugh. I, I go to the, the website. I, I Google the, the, the um, Russian and Ukrainian women's names. I get all kinds of Google responses that I don't want to be going to <laughs> because I'm, I'm not looking for a Russian bride. I'm looking for a Russian... <laughs> your wife's like, Paul, why is your internet browser have all this... Russian yeah, so, bride stuff. No, I, like, I swear I'm doing research. Yeah, the, these are these are feeders that came in when I was looking for a <laughs> substitute name. I've heard that a million times, Paul. Yeah, that excuse. Yeah, that's true. Well, it works occasionally. So, <laughs> who would possibly want to go after these people? Uh, there are still uh, government people um, over there that, um, like a 90 year old woman living in a shack, they'd want to go after them. Uh, amazingly, so uh, in. Probably not so much that individual, but what that individual downline was connected to or never been surfaced uh, in that area. So, and um, the other the other bad thing. Um, see what I can say. Um, th- there's there's a lot of um, left hand right hand in Ukraine. It's a very difficult land to work in, and. Um, the other thing we have to be careful about is generally when they see a van, I mean, we're in a white van, uh, it's not anything spectacular, but a white van pulls into a village and three coded Americans, or at least Anglos, get out and go into a little shack. Right. Generally, that means something transferred from the van to the people to the, the Holocaust person. Right. And so that when we leave, sadly on occasion, someone will go and steal or rob that, that person. Wow. Uh, we, we had one lady who had chickens, and she had like five or six chickens that they were actually snowed into, into the, the little coop. And uh, people will come and steal her chickens, and, and that's her mainstay for existence. And steal her firewood as well. She goes out and collects it. And, and I'm not talking split rails. I'm talking branches and sticks and right. things that she can physically carry back. So when you're going out to these villages or when the organization is, how do they – they have to sort of remain – secret in a sense in a sense they're, they're largely forgotten and they're very low profile uh, they, they try to stay low profile they, they don't want to be known as Jews don't want to be known as vulnerable I mean you know an 80 88 to 93 or five foot two woman is not going to be much resistance right I mean how do you and the organization when you go out to the village how do you remain kind of secretive so people don't know you're transferring or is it just inevitable yeah. It's uh, somewhat inevitable. Yeah. Uh, we, you know, we make as little uh, um, impact on, on the street as we can, but a lot of these places just have no one come up and down the street. So if there's a white van, then every, we see people out their door, looking out their window, they come out on the doorstep, and 
want to know what a van is doing in the middle of the, of the street. Um, so, I mean, you do, you do what you can do. Yeah. So why do the non-Jewish organizations want to donate to these organizations or to Israel? Because there's, I'm sure there's a lot of Christian problems out there. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good, good question. There, uh, Christians have a, a deep sense of care for the Jewish people. It's very biblical. Genesis 12, 3, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. So there's one verse that, that Christians will uh, connect uh, into. We, we certainly, we as Christian, I'm a Christian, you know, my, my biblical roots go back to the Jewish people. You know, my, my Lord, my Christ, was a Jewish person. And so we've got those roots going to back on that. Uh, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Uh, Romans uh, 8 and 11 talks about we are grafted into to the, the shaft. You know, we are part and therein. Some people interpret it again as we have an obligation. I think we're free will enough that we can or we can't. So I like to say we have a privilege of helping the Jewish people. Those are, those are the main driving reasons for yeah, it. Really interesting. And so I want to get back to the, um, the marketing aspect for a second. Sure. And the, so talk about the outside of the envelope. I think mm -hmm. when we were having dinner one time, you, you have some interesting things of what works um, or maybe what you found doesn't work as well with just looking at the outside of an envelope. What have you found that, that has worked well? For that well, the the two things that we've uncovered from let's say i've been doing this 35 years so i've had a lot of things that have not worked and we've fortunately had more things that have worked uh in the process and we have learned that a um a, a person who gives over a hundred dollars a month cumulative uh, not a month but a year uh during the month but for your hundred dollars cumulative year they will respond best to a closed face package uh no no window and ideally no teaser on it, no, no inscription, unless it's something particular like a special message from the head of the organization. But fundamentally, we want it to be, uh, it's an old example, but it still goes very, very, it's still very, very true, is that we want it to look like it just came out of the typewriter, that someone sat down, the head of the organization sat out a typewriter or at a keyboard mm -hmm. and did, dear Jeremy, I wanted you to know this special message of this person I saw, and they put it in, you know, lick, stick the sound, and put it in. So you want to carry that look as much as you can. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that fights through the, the mail that, that comes in uh, that competes with junk mail or frequent mail mm -hmm. in that area, uh, which we find we get a very high open rate up in the 90% the, the wow. range. That's uh, amazing. And we've also found that the cost for doing that, um, it'll usually be dollar five, dollar ten total in the mail that it won't support someone who's given $99 or less in a calorie year. So then we'll drop down to about a 50 cent package, which is what a window package would be. And then there we have a visual. We'll put visuals on with the teaser that there's some reason for that individual to stop as they're going through the mail and say, oh, I may want to take a look at this. And the thing that we've, uh, we've continu we're continuing to develop a, more of a skill is putting questions on there very hard for people to on the outside to a question on the outside uh, on that and um, so we we use those as uh, I don't want to reveal all your secrets but if there are any questions you could share like as an example um, we'll do usually the wills and the hows uh, that might be the better thing the thing to, not to do is a closed question uh, will you give a gift today no <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> So, <laughs> Trash. So, yeah, no, so you don't want to do anything that, that can be answered yes or no. Right. Uh, more like how will, uh, what will, uh, in what ways, uh, through the cold winter, uh, who will, uh, who can, things that there's no it's immediate open answer to that. And that's just good direct, direct response where you're selling books or you're selling clothes or tires or flowers at uh, Valentine's or whatever, if you ask a question that can be answered with yes or no, it's a bad direct response. You just don't want to do that. So. Right. Because the answer generally is no. Yeah. <laughs> it's the first response, yeah. Yes. The, I mean, you help a lot of places, not just nonprofits. Right. I mean, you help a lot of different industries. Talk about some of that. What on the outside of the envelope, maybe what's the same or what's different as far as the nonprofit side of things? Yeah, the, uh, we, we work with uh, some music companies. Uh, we work with high-end, uh, million-plus uh, real estate people. We do a lot of commercial real estate. We do residential real estate. 
and we have some parapolitical groups on that. Um, a, a parapolitical might be something like, uh, what will your grandchildren say to you when they find out you didn't vote? Uh, something <laughs> no like pressure. that. No pressure. No guilt, yeah. yeah. And it's, we, we've never used that, but that's just a quick one. But, but something like, what will your grandchildren say to you, uh, maybe about how you voted? Uh, so one of the parapolitical groups that, that we work with on that. Uh, mm. uh, and again, I'm that's, running. That's deep in psychology. Yeah, it's... Yeah. Uh, so we, you know, they, you want to get the person to get into the message. You've got two to two to five seconds for someone to really decide if they're going to to get into the message. We don't want it to be. I'll get into it later. Later never happens. Right. So we need to make sure that there's a call to action of some type. That there is an incentive, not a trick. You know, not not um nothing false or or deceptive. Right. Uh, always very clear on there as to who it's from and what it's about. But in a way to engage them so that they're their curiosity will take them inside the envelope. So, how did another would be? Uh, yeah, your your your. Um, <clears throat> we're just doing one right now. Your membership card is enclosed. See and see important information inside. So something like that. Mm -hmm. And that could be for uh, a, um, a right to bear arms group, or it could be to a music group that we work with. It could be with um, some of the the student. Um, uh, teaching groups for uh, teachers, uh, how to teach your students better to pass the state exam that they go through. That's another one that we've used that on, that, that approach. So now they're inside the envelope, right? You get them to open it because most people are uh, opening the stuff over the trash can. So getting yeah. them to open it, I think, is a big feat, actually. Um, and then they open it. What are some of the thing elements that you've learned throughout the years that you thought would work that didn't? And then what actually does work? Obviously, you talked about like you need a clear call to action, which maybe right. some people don't. What else is inside the, the envelope? Yeah, the, the, the one that, um, that we have learned and we continue to see, sadly, frequently with other, other mailers um, is the long intro. It, it, it just goes on and on about why they're talking about me, the writer, and what my organization does. and. Uh, it doesn't get to what you're supposed to do. There, there are three basic things in any package. What, do, what's in it for me? Right. What do you want me to do? And how do you want me to do it? Right. It's, it's really those three things. So the quicker you can get those into your copy, the, the quicker the person, the reader, will decide if they're going to stay and read the, the full letter or they're not going to. If there's nothing in it for me, it's all about you. I don't particularly want to read this. But if you can find something that's in there for me, um, whether it's, again, a music lesson or a high-end home or we do an equestrian area um, or even a, a tire, uh, something like that. Uh, um, will your tires, uh, I, you know, if you've got the data, uh, our, our records indicate in the next 30 days your, your tires will go bald. Do you know what the percentage of chance is of a bald tire blowing out going down the highway? Question mark. Right. Yeah. And you go right in, too. Right. Fortunately, we have blah, 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 and you go through there. So you want to make sure you've got the, the, the what's in it for them or the call to action right up front. Yeah. If it's not in the first three or four paragraphs, yeah. they're not going to read the rest of the letter. You know, Paul, all that seems obvious, you know, but I know I've made these mistakes a million times. Yeah, like, the, right. the how to do it seems obvious, but I definitely have forgotten it when people are like, well, how do I, you know, I've written things to people or... And I didn't include the actual how to do it. So that I, you know, thank you for mentioning that because I've definitely forgotten that before. Yeah, well, it's easy to do. You know, you sit down, you want to write, you start thinking what's in your head and what's about you. So to reverse that around to what's in it for the other person, and the other, the other really um, uh, skill is is uh, setting up the copy so that the individual doesn't have to do anything. You want to make it so that everything is done for them. So instead of, will you send your gift today, or will you send in your um, money order or your credit card so we can send you a tire, it's when we receive your information, we will send you your new tire. So that takes it out of the individual having to do the action because I'm tired, I'm sleepy, I don't want to mess with it, I might make a mistake. All of those things that, that you go through, so you got to reduce the risk. Reducing the friction for people to actually do it. Reduce the friction, reduce the risk, make it easy. Again, make it easy for them to do what they already want to do. Right. 
So that, that's how we change it from um, you do this to when we receive your blank, we can do this for you. Yeah. Yeah. And then tell them how to do it. Yeah. 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 Take so the postage paid envelope, complete the information, use the, the completed uh, reply device, uh, may, use your uh, postage page envelope to mail this back through. And then when we receive it, we will do this in turn on that area. And so you've got yeah. what's in it for me, what do you want me to do, and how do you want me to do it? Right. Right. Those things. Yeah. And then you need to repeat that in each of the devices. The letter should have the, the same thing, reply device should have the same thing. And if you have an insert, it should tell the same story. Because one person won't, normally a person won't read all three. They'll usually read parts of one or they'll only read one. Only read the reply device, only read the, the insert, or they'll only read the, the letter. Yeah, so. so we have the outside, the inside, and, and you mentioned the remorse, buyer's remorse or whatever the remorse is. Is there a follow-up that you recommend? Or how do you um, actually equate for the remorse or eliminate the remorse? Mm -hmm. We do that in, in the, the donor sphere where we're working with that. We have newsletters that go out, and uh, they're really not a newsletter. They're, it's a collection of four to five small indirect asks that go out, but they're very carefully worded, and, and the stories are selected that we demonstrate where the funds went, how the donor uh, did make a difference in somebody's life, and we validate that it actually did happen. So that's how we confirm back. So when someone says, gosh, I sent $50 to this organization, I was a, a doofus, they just spent it and went to Florida or wherever, whatever they did with it, but you show them your $50 provided this food box, and there's a picture of somebody carrying a food box in to uh, Olga, and they say, oh yeah, well there's my $50, that's where it went. So I, okay, I feel pretty good about that. What about on the uh, merchandising standpoint for, for the non non nonprofit for the profit businesses. Yeah. What that, do you do for the remorse? And, and that's where space ads are still extremely valuable. Uh, it, and that's a big confusion. Space ads are really not to get the order. Space, space ad is only for, I think it's 15% uh, of a readership of any publication really will give a focused uh, attention to your ad. So you really got to forget the other 85% that are in there. And so you want to reinforce again. Um, so talk about space ad for a second for people who don't know. Uh, and um, well, space ads any and actually it's online too. You can do that the same way, uh, but the same principles work online as they work in in mail. And frequently we forget that most of what works online worked in the mail years and years and years ago. We're just transferring those same marketing disciplines, marketing skills, the techniques, the the uh, the research that we gain from on uh, offline. We can use it online. Yeah. So. So we can, um, I can remember where I was going before. I was so you're going to say space ads um, space for ads. the remorse, but for people who don't know, what is a space ad actually? Yeah, uh, that's um, uh, an ad in a magazine that would be Cadillac's latest uh, car that they're coming out with, um, the, um, or, or, a, or an event that's coming through. So it's taking up space in a publication. Got it. Newspaper, magazine, um, uh, transit is another way. It's really a space ad that's just in a moving vehicle. Same thing. It's called transit, but it's a different outdoor. It's a space ad just up on a billboard. Uh, same deal. And the, the principles still work the same way. You've got you know two to five seconds, a little bit more if it's in a publication, in a magazine, a um, Time or a People or a Wall Street Journal or something like that. A little more time, but not, not much more. Maybe another two or three seconds. So got to capture the intention. Uh, some arresting figure again. What's in it for me, and what's the benefit I'll get out of it, and what do I do? Yeah. And Paul. then for like the real estate niche, let's take or whatever niche. How do they um, stop buyer's remorse after the fact that someone purchases? It it, uh, it shows. Um, let me think of um, Cadillac was on. Uh, saw a Cadillac ad. The, the Dare Greatly. Uh, Roosevelt's great great quote. Uh, if you haven't read his, that leads up to the Dare Greatly, but you'll see somebody who's um, affluent, who is looks happy, they're driving down the road, there's no traffic, uh, they're happy and content, all of their favorite songs are on. That was a good idea. You know, you know <laughs> I, I bought this Cadillac and look what happened. No traffic, all of my songs are here. Happy spouse, you know, happy mate, happy, happy life. Uh, Happy wife, happy life, as it goes. Right. Um, so you demonstrate the product in use is, is really what you do. Uh, 
uh, and you just show that, yes, this was a good decision. Here's how it is. Here's a visual confirmation that this worked well. Um, yeah. Paul, what are some big mistakes? So we're talking direct mail, you know, obviously it's transferable offline to online and the parallels yeah. there. What are some big mistakes you you are seeing of people in the online space not using all the principles of the offline direct mail? Yeah, there, there, are, there are a couple of really uh, consistent ones, quite offensive if I may say. Yeah, go ahead. And that is using a lot of reverse type. Uh, it's just it's the, the kiss of death to do that. What uh, do you mean? What's reverse type? Uh, like, like a black background and white type. Mm. Uh, very hard to read. Uh, readability scores are very, very low on that. Uh, I have an expression that I use it, uh, where I say uh, a, per, a reader can't hear what you write until they see what you say. <laughs> so if they can't see what they're looking at, they can't then hear what you said in the, in the communication. So... Uh, and it's a big, a lot of younger designers want to do that. A purple background with bright yellow and orange in there. And Yankovic and Starch did research a long time ago for McGraw Hill. And they um, found out what fatigues the eye. And when the eye fatigues, the brain shuts off. The eye may still keep reading, but the brain is already shut off and it's thinking about supper or, you know, what's coming on TV or whatever they're doing. So if you make it, hard for the brain to stay engaged, yeah. which comes from a non-fatigued eye, then they're going to go away and they won't even see you. I don't, and I, have, uh, I think you can see it back over there. There's a sign on my wall that uh, one of my marketing godfathers gave to me 30, 43 years ago, 43 years ago. And it says, don't tell me it's good looking. Tell me it moves merchandise. And that's a big key of, of a lot of online stuff now that's beautiful, looks great moves it glows and does everything but it doesn't move merchandise because it confuses the buyer and that's the second thing is there's so much content on there makes it hard to figure out what to do the third thing is when you transfer from a landing page over to the, the buying page or, or some other next page if it doesn't look the same then the person goes uh oh what happened to my link where did i go so you need to transfer that look from one site to the other one page to the other big big mistake on doing that. Any other ones that you're seeing people make or any good applications? Uh, the, the, other, the other one just to reinforce is it's not about you. It, it's about the buyer. It's about the reader. It's about the donor. It's about the constituents. It's about the member. What's it's in it for them? So people are yeah. still doing the long not intro. Whether, it's not in the mail, but it's online. It's more the long intro and not talking about their needs. Yeah, yeah. We started, we've been in business since 1934. We have the third largest organization in America. We sell more than anybody else does. We do this, we do that, we do this. It's good. I don't care. <laughs> tell me, tell me what you know. How does it help me? So that's that's the other big thing to do on that. Um, a lot of people are getting really smart now with uh, websites, uh, good visuals. Uh, you know, we kind of went through the talking about space ads again. There was a day when. Um, like popular mechanics, I don't even know if that still is around, but some of the ads are in there, you know, there's just like, oh, electronics. Uh, there's like a million things on the page, you know, and that's good when you're looking for those things, but if you're flipping through the magazine, that's not good. So a lot of websites are like that. It's had way too much content on it. Very hard to, to, to get through to the point. So some of these big visuals that are coming through now, easy to navigate, little sidebar about some interesting facts to get into. Again, you, it's, it's basic marketing. You want to get them engaged into what they're already right. interested in. Make it easy for them to do what they already want to do. Right. And Same Paul, basic. so we were talking before about designing things better. So how can people, or how do you design things better? Uh, again, making sure it's not reversed, uh, not a dark background with light type. I go the other way. Um, I like to, uh, and this will be very controversial with some of the designers who, who may by chance listen to this is I still insist upon two spaces after every sentence uh, Why is that? Line, uh, because it gives the eye an anchor point to rest and so as you read along copy it just kind of goes it <gasps> kind of takes an inhale the eye just kind of inhales it gets it knows that. where it's, to okay. go next <laughs> okay great now I can go on to the next sentence <laughs> and take another little rest and do that uh, cross headers uh, same reason 
uh, if there's a big block of text in there, it's like, oh my gosh, I don't have the time to read it, don't want to read it, uh, I'll get back to it later. Later never ever happens, ever happens, particularly online. So if you've got crossheads in there, which basically tell a, a narrative of your story, then they can go through and go, yeah, yeah, okay, great, then I'll read this paragraph. Short paragraphs, um, Ogilvy said the, the, the perfect sentence is 12 words long, next to impossible to write a 12 word sentence, next to impossible, but it's a great challenge. And if you keep that in mind, then you'll keep from writing something like Oliver Goldsmith did, which was he'd write a four or five page paragraph. Uh, well done, and there's a lot of learning there, but it's hard to read, you certainly won't buy anything from that. Um, so uh, short paragraphs, they don't have to connect, forget about you know this, all the topic fits in one paragraph. Make it easy to jump from one to the other. Uh, always have a jump at the bottom of the page or at the, the fold so that it doesn't end on a, on a period or at or an end word. This is what you can do today, period. Game over. Don't go any further. This is what you can, under the fold, do today to help make your life better. It so keeps them reading. Keep, keep, them, keep them reading on that. Uh, again, make it easy for them to continue on instead of uh, bailing out on you. So those are some things. Uh, watching Sans Serif, uh, particularly Sans Serif without the little little feet on it, the little serifs at the bottom of a character, um, you your eye behind you has a little foot on there. So those help guide the eye. The eye actually goes up, hmm. goes to the foot, goes up, goes to the foot, goes up, go to the foot, and it helps the eye stay on line. So that's the font you like. Say again. That's the font you prefer. That's the yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, on certain certain things. Now, if you get sans serif in a small non bold face type online, then it runs together. There's not enough uh, uh, digital space for it Spacing. to be distinctive. So that runs. So in that case, you want to make sure you go uh, sans serif, whereas no feet on it, and be careful that it doesn't get too thin. Can't make it bold all the time, yeah. but make sure it's not thin. Again, it just closes in. And How so, do you even yeah. discover something like that? I mean, what I love about you, Paul, is you're so meticulous about this because you know every little bit can make a difference. Yeah. How do you even discover that? Uh, training, you know, going to places, uh, taking courses, a lot of yeah. reading. Uh, Mel Warwick, Warwick was one of my early, never met him, but mentors. I read everything that he, that he wrote. Um, going back through the classics. Um, uh, research, the entire mean based on study, and a lot of times just, you know, that didn't work, so let's do something different. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you consider the classics? Um, Who do you like? I, Ogilvy, certainly. Um, I think he's like my ideal. I, I loved his creative. I loved his um, his make the meringue rise. You know, he, he, Ogilvy was a French chef for a while, or French uh, pastry chef. I think pastry is the right word. Uh, but he he was in, when he worked, the guy who couldn't make the meringue rise always got fired. So, you know, <laughs> being attentive to making your meringue rise. Right. You know? So that so that's when I go through and I check my indentions, I check my crossheads, I check the fonts that we're going through, I check the, the line length. Another key thing, a line length should never be longer than 26 characters of that font. If it's any longer than that, the eye fatigues, the eye stops reading. Mm. So that's another thing to go through. Um, forget who I learned that from. Uh, good mentors, um, you know, being around people and um, had some very good direct response. Uh, Jim Killian and Tom McCabe. Uh, Jim Killian was great. Uh, I'd, I'd taken a lot of stuff to him and he said, it's not going to work. I tell you, Jim, it will work. We'd mail it and it wouldn't work, and I'd come back. So right, you're right, it didn't work. And, what was and something so, like that um, that he said didn't that wouldn't work, and the, people were disbelieving. Uh, it wasn't that they were disbelieving; they just didn't respond to it. Uh, and it was making sure that the photographs have action in them and they have people in them. And if the photograph, if for nonprofit, if the person doesn't express need, then why am I helping this person? So you've got to make sure that you communicate that, and then we run into that. It gets to be an argument uh, uh, about is that the specific individual that you're talking about, or is it an example? And then you put a you put a disclaimer that says uh, because this uh, uh, I see pri privacy and um, um, what's the other word? I don't, we don't use danger. Can't think of the word that we use. Um, but anyway, you put like, a disclaimer in there that says yeah. they're not all the same on that. 
So you've got to represent the need on that uh, is what you do. Um, the people, uh, yeah, you get a lot of, there was one big article not too long ago, I forget what it was. Um, but you know, if you if you put ugly, ill-advised people in your ads, nobody wants to identify with those. That's why you have attractive models in there. You want to identify with the male or female. You, you know, in, internally we have this ego that we identify with, and if it's someone who's less attractive, that product didn't help them, or that didn't fulfill my need. Mm -hmm. I don't look like that. I want to look like this over here. Mm -hmm. So again, not to be deceptive, but uh, I. They want to do that, so I'm making it easy for them to do what they want to do again. So that's one of the things. And uh, the other thing that I've, uh, I, I borrowed from that, but I came up with it on my own, is that the, the photographs have to be huggable. It has to be somebody that you would go up and hug yourself. And if it doesn't pass the huggable metric and right. guideline, then we don't use that photo. The, how long is the copy usually when you send out those, like the nonprofit ones? Uh, like how many pages is it? Two, usually two a front back, sometimes okay. two to one sides. Uh, the the uh, what is it? Ogilvy says uh, the letter should be no longer than it takes to tell the story. So one one line of twelve words, if that tells the story, and twenty one pages, if that's what it takes right. to tell the story. So we've had good success with eight page letters. Um, mm -hmm. Never had a sixteen page, but I've seen some really effective sixteen page letters go out. Uh, what industry have you found that you've felt the need to tell? The, like the story's been longer, like in the real estate industry or something. What what is uh, what equates to pages in some of those products that you you were sending uh, out? Usually, uh, that's a, that's a good one to start with. Real estate usually is more visual. It's more about the visual and the lifestyle, so not a lot of facts in that. Uh, cars are the same way. Cars, you want to use a lot of really um, engaging words, not not uh, pedantic words, but you know the rich uh, rich Corinthian leather, you know th things like that that make you want to be engaged with it. Right. Um, uh, the ones I think selling. Uh, merchandising, presenting, offering, all those words could, could fit in there, would be um, training, training or intellectual property. Uh, it just it takes a while to get into that, uh, to, to do the, the testimonials, here's what you'll get, here are the 12 things, here's uh, the things you should avoid, here's what will happen if you don't. I mean, those, they have so much content in them, they, they get to be believable just because of the content. I don't think anyone ever reads those things word for word, but it's like, okay, where, where's the buy? You know, where, where's, where, where can I order? Where, where can I order? Right. And, and the smart people do that, in particular online, they'll, they'll put the little, you know, the, the, the call to action or, or the go here or the click here so they go through because it's if someone makes a decision early, don't force them to go through 45 minutes of some other talking head or cartoon or something that's going on. It's like, okay, I like it. Let, let me get to it. I, I got to go. Yeah. And Paul, you were mentioning the sign from one of your mentors, right? Don't tell me it's good looking. Tell me it moves merchandise. Right. So, what are, are there any other lessons that you learned from from that individual? From from Tom, yeah. it was Tom Helzer, God rest his soul. Uh, Tom is uh, was the individual who first brought out Slurpees. Slurpees. He, yeah, he was the Slurpee merchandiser, Seven Eleven. Really. And back in sixties or seventies, somewhere back in there. And Tom was a, a sales promotion uh, person, and his job, uh, it was called um, Icy. Icy was the first. I, I For sure, yeah. Yeah, Icy was they the first. They had the red ones with the, yeah, I know exactly, yeah. yeah. And uh, so so he was the one that, that first, because um, I'd take things to him and say, Tom, this is great. What do you think? Like, he'd go, oh, my gosh, this is awful. He'd red pen it, and he'd say, you know, read the sign, you know, and doofus, read the sign. Don't <laughs> the, you know, tell me what he's his merchandise. Um, how did you meet him? Uh, I met him going back to connecting to one thing you asked me earlier about how I learned some of the things to do. I met him at uh, a marketing group. Uh, I tried to go to any, and I still do. Uh, I'm, I'm in four or five different mastermind groups right now. Right. Uh, so I, I believe in lifetime learning. I believe in insatiable curiosity. And so I went to this group, and it probably was divine in some way. Uh, Tom, Tom was five one maybe and I'm six uh, three and a half and so Tom came over and 
grabbed me and looked up at me and said, hey, tell me about this organization you're working with. And uh, <laughs> He was 5'1". Yeah, 5'1". And um, yeah, I still remember that scene, and it was like, okay. So we went over and sat down, and he took me under wing. And uh, so I would take things through and ask him, and um, he would give me advice and counsel. And um, so, uh, you know, was going back to uh, a lot of the things that the early people um, in our industry have found is being around other smart people. Yeah. It's more like being around you and Brian Kurtz. You know, you put smart people in a room, good things are, well, are bound you. to happen. I don't know if I could be in the same uh, realm as, as you and Brian Kurtz yet, but uh, give me like 20 years. Yeah, um, so, certainly so. <laughs> Everybody has something to share, and so just, just learning it. You know? Yeah. You know, I mentioned at the top of the interview, Paul, about the company going from $4 million to $90 million. And charitable right. support. Um, so, what are some? I, I know there's a lot of little things, but that, that's remarkable. Um, what are some of the things that you equate to that amount of success? How did that company first find you? They uh, through a friend, through a referral, uh, knowing someone who knew someone, and I got a call one day that uh, one of my friends, whom I had helped to find a position somewhere else, which is funny, I worked for him and he worked for me at one point, so we both worked for each other and I found a position for him. And one of his friends came to him and said, hey, I need some help with marketing, do you know anybody? And so he said, well, you need to talk to Paul. And so he connected me and um, it just, uh, I, uh, one of the expressions I really love is giving opportunity a chance. And so I'm with groups, I'm in meetings, I'm going to places and giving opportunity a chance. And so David, David Walters, as it was, happened to introduce me. And um, so I made the call and he said, yeah, uh, let's talk. And I did one thing that I got to do and that worked. And so I got to do one more thing and that worked. And And eventually kind of went from there and added on. And then it was, uh, well, gee, how are we going to do this? And I said, well, I've got some experience in that area. And fortunately, I did. I'd come from good, good training, good background, and, uh, and and even when I was in retail, I spent nine years in retail and clothing, and just learning how to work with customers, follow up, and a lot of what I, I learned in retail from John Spilliers, uh, my my department manager, I still use today. Uh, how to take care of people, how to make them feel good in, in a genuine, honest, caring way, uh, never deceptive, never tricky, and going through there and. That's the same thing we do in direct mail, same thing we do in online. And our, our lead gen, when you get a lead gen ad, where do they go? What through, through what funnel or through cycle? Uh, what's the follow-up when they lapse, when, when, they, or when they buy? Make sure that there's a good uh, follow-up on that. You made a good decision. Here's why you made a good decision. Here's something else you might want to be interested in. So all of that I learned uh, when I was in retail, uh, sending out notes, you know, thank you notes to people who come in, letting them know when something was available. Um, caring about them, um, um, I, I'm a big, big believer in, uh, what is it, that um, um, uh, Zig, 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 Zig Ziglar would yeah. say, if you yeah. help enough people get what they want, eventually you'll get what you want. So it's just, it's helping people to, to get what they want. Yeah. That's one of my favorite quotes for sure. It's, it's great. Uh, I, met, I met Zig, I met Zig in person. Oh, really? Yeah. Just at a, uh, in passing or a uh, he's he, from Texas, right? From or, Texas, yeah. uh, from Dallas. And are you from Yazoo, Mississippi, if I remember my story right, but lived in Dallas. And uh, his son went to a summer camp where I was a marketing director. And again, we had good experience with the son. Zig wanted to be a part of what we were doing. And so I called him up, asked him if he had help. And he was very, very generous with his time and effort. And did that so He's a legendary yeah yeah right so nine years in in retail yep. i want to hear some of the lessons and one in particular you have this the sock rack principle oh yes yeah talk it's, about that for a second it's fun thank you for bringing that up and I, I, again i still use it today you ask about the carrier uh the teaser and the visual on a carrier still the sock rack still the sock rack principle on that and so when i was in retail i bought men's clothing uh, for Hart Shafter Marks uh, out of Chicago, uh, they're still there, uh, and we had a, I don't know, maybe a four foot tall by three foot wide sock rack, and it was filled with 95% black socks, because that's what most people bought then, was 95% of it was black socks, 
the other 5% would be Navy, and then the other would be a scattering. And so I learned if I had a, a sock rack of all blacks and navies, I wouldn't sell as many socks if I would buy a half dozen bright yellow or lime green or red or purple and just have a little variety on that rack with all of these black sock, blacks and navy socks and I would sell more socks. And I, and I would take them off and I'd try all, all, all dark and it wouldn't sell as much. I'd put them back on and the sales would go up. And, and I'm talking, you know, like a hundred dozen black socks and half a dozen red, half a dozen yellow, half a dozen lime green. I, I guess, I guess grandmothers bought them for Christmas gifts. I don't even know who bought them. <laughs> <laughs> but I sold more black socks when I had bright yellow and bright green. So I do that all through So my why life. is that? I, my, my guess is it, it takes the drabness away from the all black rack or just a mundane situation. It draws attention, makes someone remember, oh yeah, uh, yellow socks, who buys yellow socks? Oh yeah, I need black socks. I, I'm, something that engages them, it entertains them in some way. They are colorful. Uh, I mean, many a time I remember going, just thinking, it's ah, such a pretty yellow, you know? I can't wear it with my dark black or navy suit, but this is such a pretty yellow sock, you know, just really pretty. So part of so, it attracts people, and part of it, once it attracts them, it points them to the obvious choice? It does. I think it's breaking inertia, which is another big principle of direct response, is you want to break inertia, which is why publishers at Clearinghouse had such success with the, um, which color Corvette do you want when you win your prize? <laughs> Pull off the color that you want, stick it on the carrier, and when you win your Corvette, it was a Jaguar, remember, and when you win your Jaguar, then you'll get the color that you wanted. So, you know, I'm going to peel off the, the, the red Jaguar and stick it on there. So then you break the inertia, oh, what the heck, I'll do some magazines while I'm at it, you know. I don't know if there's any other lessons, Paul, but you had a three options when you were in retail that you would give people. Mm -hmm. Talk and about I that. And I still do that today. I yeah. still do yeah. the same way. Even when I do my ask, my ask arrays right now, I'll do multiple choices uh, so that they've got an option. Uh, and, and that was where I had learned uh, early in my selling days that I, uh, someone would want a coat and tie or a shirt or a sweater or a sports outfit or something. And I'd just go over and they would say, I need some help. So I'd pick out what I thought was the very best thing. Just put it out there, just gorgeous. And they'd look at it and go, yeah, I'm not sure. And then sometimes they'd leave, sometimes they'd buy it, or sometimes they'd goof around. So I learned if I put something really fashionable, pretty uncomfortable for more, most people to wear, but still nice. High end. High end, high end. Really take someone with some moxie to wear it. And then I'd get something really nice, middle of the road. And then I'd get something that was almost ugly. Very pedestrian, very <laughs> very mundane. That's what I would probably have chose. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and then you, then you, you show the high fashion, you show this really nice, uh, acceptable, and then you show the ugly, and generally they pick the one in the middle. And so I think it's the principle there is choice and, and knowing what to do. Part of it is I don't want to make a bad decision. So if I see something that's too wild for me to wear, then I won't wear that. I see something that's too ugly for me to wear, I'm not going to wear that, then this must be good. Yeah. And it, it made, a, made a huge difference. Yeah. I use it still all the time. I never direct mail. I use it online all the time on online right yeah. now. It's framing. Yeah, talk about how you use it. I know it's been used on me. I think, you know, with the real estate stuff, when they were showing us the house, I didn't realize at the time until after I learned more marketing principles, but they definitely went to, like, this really, really nice place, and they went to this really horrible place, yeah. and then there was a middle-of-the-road place. And yeah. I was like, well, that I can't afford. This is horrible. This is way better than the horrible one. So, right. but anyways, yeah. how do you use it? Yeah, and I, I think that... Um uh, people don't know what they want until they know what they don't want. And that helps them to figure out what they don't want. It, it takes away some of the risk. It takes away the confusion. It, it makes it easier for them to make a decision. And um, the, yeah, even on, um, well, you, uh, you've seen around many a time in um, online packages. Uh, you can get the ninety the, the, the nine dollar ninety seven cent package, or you can get the nine thousand nine hundred ninety seven dollar package, 
or you can get the nine hundred ninety-seven dollar package. Right. So you got got the framings in there, right. you know. And most of the guys never expect to sell the, the ten, whatever the range is, the the, the top end. It, it's having what is it? Kennedy said, you know, it's having a gold package, or a platinum right. package. Platinum gold. You know, it's yeah, right. it, it's a hundred thousand dollar package, and, and six people in the world are going to do it, but three hundred people are going to do the the one thousand package. So, uh, in one of the key retailers and almost had his name, Harvey, not Harvey Winston, in Toronto, but, but a, lot of, a lot of retailers will do that. Um, you'll, you'll have the very, very expensive high-end car, suit, or whatever, and seldom do you ever expect to sell those, but it sells a bunch. It's back to the black sock and, and yellow socks story. You know, it's, it's having that comparison and a frame. And, and framing and anchoring is, is a big part of merchandising. I'm glad you brought that up. If you can get that anchor in early, uh, which is where a lot of the online people are, are doing, get the anchor in. Here's a nine hundred ninety dollar package. Normally, one thousand nine hundred. The super package is nine thousand. You've got those anchors, right. and you've got the framing in there. So great key key uh, concepts. Right. What have you found? Any percentage breakdown works better. Like the platinum package is like three times the middle, or the middle is. X amount more than the, the lower. Is there any math that you've seen that's that's worked as far as, as that goes? Or um, the the one I'm seeing is the the ninety sevens. It ends in ninety sevens, uh, and there is a psychology there. Uh, typically, ninety nines are sale oriented. If you go into Walmart or Kmart or Neiman Marcus or wherever you're going into, mm. again making a framing there. Usually the sale items are 99. Hmm. So in the 95s or not, and you'll want to make it round, uh, certainly not $19, 1895 is what you want to do, uh, or 1899. Um, so I've seen the 97 be, be a really good, a lot of people use the 97s. Uh, I don't have a percentage from yeah. 97 to 199, 197. Yeah, I'm just curious, yeah, if you've seen anything like that. Um, so Paul, you grew up in in Texas, right? Texas. Right. Yeah. So when you were growing up, what did you want to be? Oh, professional baseball player. Ba- baseball player. Oh yeah. And you if played I, baseball. Any talent, any talent at all, I would have been a professional baseball player. Did you have talent? Uh, no, I didn't have any talent. Because <laughs> you mentioned too early on that you have Cubs. Are you? You're not a Cubs fan though. You have, you said you have Cubs tickets. Yeah. Uh, you? Again, I, uh, back there on the wall, I got to go to the Cubs playoff game, not this year, but year before last. It was a quick, quick, funny story. Uh, I, I got in, I was actually at a, at a mastermind uh, meeting with Dan Sullivan, and uh, got on the, the train, went downtown. The Cubs game was going on. I got there about the fifth inning, bought a ticket, and it was, uh, they were playing the Cardinals. It was the, the first year they'd really been in the playoffs in a long time. They're playing the Cardinals, the, the Nemes, the hated Cardinals. And uh, so and I had a red jacket on, and uh, uh, cranberry it wasn't red cranberry. And uh, <laughs> so I got the ticket. It was one to one when I the fifth inning, and I went in and sat down. And all these guys around me were like Saturday Night Live, the, the Bears, and I mean, big old robust and vocal. And and so I came in in this red jacket. I sat down, and the Cubs hit a home run. Just like I sit down, home run. It goes up, and they're like, "Look what you did! You did! You're our good luck!" And they, and that was the, the night that there were more home runs hit than any other game in Major League Baseball history. Wow! And so I was their good luck charm. So I got all this ribbing, you know, and, and, and you've got to come back to the next game and and everything. So, so that uh, we're that, friendly in Chicago. Yeah, very, very. Yeah, you know, it was great. Of course, I'm a Cubs fan, and. Uh, uh, certainly like the Rangers, you know, Mickey Mantle would be my hero. Shortstop is what I wanted to play. I got hit in the nose too many times with bad balls to continue to be a good shortstopper. But uh, uh, that, that would be my fun so thing. So how did you get into then the world of direct response? I, I think I've always had um, uh, going to um, back unique ability. Uh, I, I think just, you know, the package that, that I came with, uh, I, I've done some uh, this is really interesting, and I have talk, haven't talked about this at all. As a matter of fact, I just uncovered it last week in another group that I was in, yeah. Stegen group, great, great group. Um, the, uh, I think what we do today plant seeds for what will happen in the future. One of my goals in life is to make life better for my great-great-grandchildren. Hmm. And right now I have a 17-and-a-half-year-old as my oldest grandchild. 
So I'm talking two generations that don't exist right now. Right. And the way that I think I can make life better for them is to make me a better person now so that I can do things that will help make life better for them. And it's going to be a difficult life then. Having looked back in a conversation last week, which I'd never come across, my grandfather, uh, I, I love to say I'm from Texas, I'm uh, in a, a long, long-standing uh, Texas cattle rancher family. Now that's true. However, it's river bottom ranchers. What's that? River bottom ranchers are the guys who bought the land in the, the river bottoms. Mm. And in the river bottoms, even now we have flood control is an issue, but back then there was no flood control whatsoever. So when the rivers would flood, it would come way, way up, two, three hundred feet up in, into, up into the, the mountainside. So nobody would buy that land. You couldn't build a house on it, you couldn't farm it, you couldn't put animals on it, or it's difficult to put animals on it. So my grandfather would buy this, these acres along the river bottom for like a dollar an acre or something. And then he would put cows down there. He would run cattle. And they were wild as animals, and they were very difficult to do. But that, he, but he made a living. He had eight, eight children and two that passed away, so Jeez. ten total. Wow. And the guy figured out how to make a living out of the river bottoms. And so there's that entrepreneurial spirit. I only met my grandfather maybe three times in my life. He died at 93, hmm. and I would have been six or seven when I last saw him. And I think I only saw him two other times before that. So I had... No indicate, no conversation with him. We didn't sit down and he told me the facts of life and how to be an entrepreneur. But somewhere, someplace, he did that. Yeah. It's transferred. It got passed down somehow. Somehow to me, yeah. and hopefully somehow it'll go forward. So I think there's always been, and I've done genetics, and I think there's some other things in there. Uh, and I still remember, I got out of the Army, and somebody asked me what I wanted to do. And I said, I'm not for sure, but I, I know it'll always be involving merchandising. Really? Some capacity. Uh, and I had a paper route when I was... Uh, uh, in junior high, and I used to be the one who for them to collect the bottles, and we'll go and get candy and stuff. And You're always enterprising. Some, yeah. some, somehow, it's part of it. You know, yeah. it's part of the unique ability that's in there. So I, I pursued. Um, well, the other reason I took marketing in college is so I didn't have to take uh, a second year of, uh, lang of language. That was the other reason I went into. Uh, I thought about pre-law, but uh, you have to take two two years of Spanish or, or some language. So. You don't in, in marketing, um, but I went back and got my law degree, degree later. Uh, but you didn't have to take language to do that. Uh, so I've always just had a, a an interest in it, and so I went from throwing papers. I worked in a grocery store. Uh, then I went to the clothing store, sold. Was a department manager, was a buyer, was a merchandise manager, and then when I went to SMU, I, I did marketing, and then my MBA is in market general business uh, marketing. And then all of the courses, I'm taking a ton of courses, just a ton of courses, and they're all merchandise marketing oriented. Yeah. Uh, so that's. So, Paul, kind of how have you come up with, what have you come up with lately? Because I know you always think about helping and leaving a legacy. What have you come up with lately of how will you make sure your great, great, great grandchildren are in a good place or something that you leave behind? What, what are you thinking now about well, that? The, the, again, the main thing is is to work on me, to, to get as much of me out of the way of me as I can. Uh, what does that uh, being, look like? Being a, being a fallen human. Um, mm -hmm. they're, they're, the easy way I've, I've come up with to describe it, there's a, a song, um, Young is his last name. But anyway, it says, uh, when I'm with you, I'm the person I want to be. It's a good song. What I've reversed is said, when I'm with me, I'm the person I want to be. So I'm trying to be everything that I, I can be, integrity, honest, direct, caring, considerate. Um, and, and it's a journey. You know, it's a journey. It's, it's uh, as our, our scripture says, you know, it's, it's a continuum until we reach perfection. I'm not sure that definition of perfection is what we think of it meaning. I think it's just more of a journey than, a, than an ending point. Yeah. So you think by you just self-improving, that will then just happen? Like you just continue to make yourself better. You're going to make everyone else around you better, your, your family. And that, then that will basically um, allow you to be in the position to, for your family to, you know, or you to leave a legacy to your family and great-great-grandchildren. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think the, the, the example, um, when my grandchildren, my children 
and my because the children you have some uh, children in the business. I have two. Yeah, yeah. My, my son and my daughter. Yeah. So yeah. talk about their roles a little bit. Uh, uh, both in account uh, service, uh, and, and people usually say, "How is that?" And I say, "Well, it's great for me, but you have to ask them how it is for them." <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's fun. I enjoy having them here. So, uh, and then I and I send them to the many of the same courses. Uh, my son and daughter have been to Singularity University that I went through a great program. Uh, they both been a strategic coach. Uh, one of them's been through Stegen. Uh, so as many times as I can get, when I learn something, I say, this is really good for me, that I want to put them in that position so that they can, and they'll, they'll learn different things from, for them than I learned for me, yeah. and hoping that's it. And uh, I think in some ways, uh, Brand you and the other, um, what's that expression? If you want to know who you will be and where you will be in five years, just look at the people you're around and the books you're reading today. Is that sh- not Shoeless Joe Jackson, but Jack, one of the Jacksons, like, Jackson Five, one of the Jacksons. <laughs> Shoeless Joe or Michael Jackson, one of the two. Yeah, yeah. Jackson. I forget what his name is. Anyway, uh, so I, I'm a real believer in that. I, yeah. I look at the people that I'm around, and I'm and the absorbing them, and I think they absorb from me. Hundred uh, percent. It's not a goal of mine. I'm, I'm really just focusing on me. But I think that's what is the you know the the thing of the butterflies. You know, f- you know, butterflies all get together, and then eventually islands over the. Same thing will happen. I'm not quite sure that happens, but I, I, I think there's an intuitive that works that way. And um, um, I can just make the world a, a little bit better, not a world saver. I don't believe, I no longer believe I can save the world. That was back when I was in the 20s, in my 20s. Uh, but, but I think I can make it better by treating my, my treating myself better, number one. Uh, you know, there, there are two, two basic principles. Uh, have no other God before you and love your neighbor as yourself. We can't love your neighbor unless you love yourself. Right. So if I treat my neighbors the way I treat myself sometimes, I'm not very nice to them. So I'm trying to, to come through a better better position on that, understanding myself better. The uh, What is it uh, Marianne Williamson says? You know, it's, it's not the, uh, the fear that I'm inadequate. It's the fear that I'm really good. Hmm. So I'm really trying to embrace my skills, not in, a, not in an ego way, not in a pedantic way, not in a, a um, hedonistic way. But to just to embrace them, just to be real with who they are, it's 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 just as I think it's just as wrong to be overly inflated as it is to be underinflated. And to say, oh my gosh, I'm no good. I can't do this and this and that and the other. Just to say, well, I can do this. I, I do do that. I don't do this, but I do do this. I do this well. And yeah. I, I do marketing well. And we did go from from four million with one organization. We're actually up to hundred and twenty six million this wow. year. That's amazing. On that, so they're. Uh, their their first appeal before me, their first their, their highest appeal, not the first, their highest appeal before I came in, was um, seventeen thousand dollars, and now we'll do we'll do around six million dollars a month right now. Wow, seventeen thousand remarkable. It is, and congratulations. I had, a, I had yeah. a great person. Thank you. I had a great person leading the organization who made it possible. For us to do what we it's do. It's obviously a team effort, yeah. 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 So with, without that person leading, uh, at, uh, I like to say it's like the, the head gander does for the, the other, breaks that, that vortex out there so that the other geese can fly along behind him. And that's what he did. He very adventuresome, very willing to understand marketing and willing to take chances. And sometimes he took chances and didn't work. And But most of the time he took chances and it did work. Yeah. So. So, Ply, two questions. Thank you so much, by the way, for, for the time. This is, this is very valuable. Um, I have two last questions, but um, before I ask them, I want to point people towards your website and where should they check you out online. I know uh, BighamAgency.com. Uh, right. People can go to B-I-G-H-A-M and then Agency.com. Are there any other places we should point people towards online? Uh, just making sure that there's no N in there. The, the Binghams are my Irish cousins, the renegade cousins, and we don't associate with them. So it's just the Binghams. So no, just B-I-G, not B-I-N-G. Right. Uh, that's right. it. And then, you know, if anybody has questions, I'm happy to entertain questions. Are uh, you, like, trying to focus right now on certain industries? Or do you, like, what type of clients do you take on? Or do you prefer nonprofits if someone's looking to... Uh, you know, for uh, a marketing agency, direct response, and looking for what you do. Yeah, we, we do both. Uh, we 
it, when we initially started out, we were a commercial agency and we did about 20% nonprofit. And then just the way development goes and things nurture, we became an 80% nonprofit and 20% uh, commercial. And now we're, we're closer, not 50%, but we're closer to that. So we have a lot of non nonprofit organizations that we work with. Mm -hmm. So anyone who has direct response, I love space ads. So if you have a space ad, let me do your space ads. I love space ads. Uh, they're, they're not as effective as other things, but they're fun to do. Yeah. Uh, so any anything with direct response on that uh, yeah. mastermind groups, you know, we love to work with them mm -hmm. too. So personal development. Anyone wants to grow from four million to ninety million, you should hire. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and but and be a be a good leader for it so that we can do that. Yeah, that's, right, that's right. So two last questions. One, you have obviously from talking to you, you have a huge focus on customer service, right? Yes. Customer service landed your wife. Yes. Talk about that for a second. Uh, I'd forgotten that we talked about that. <laughs> we didn't actually. Just from we my didn't. research. No. Oh, did you really? Yeah. Oh, well, good. That's that's fun. Um, after my paper route, uh, I graduated to working at the grocery store, and uh, I think I made 81 cents an hour, I think is what it was. Uh, and um, so when you're a package boy, you have a little bit of flexibility as to which line you go to to, to package. You have a checker, you have a customer, and that person puts the stuff into the bag. So they were called package boys at that point. And um, we, were, we were young. We were 16, 17, 18. And uh, we would always know when an attractive daughter came into the store, and then we figure out who the mother was. <laughs> and, the daughter. and so, whenever this particular mother came in, who had these two particular daughters that I thought were quite attractive, I learned to make sure that I got to package her packages or, or groceries, and it was um, um, engaging and conversational, and and developed a friendship right. uh, with the mother. And then when I was promoted to, to checker from 81 to 89 cents an hour, I got to be a checker, then the mother would come over into my line and wait for me for, to check. Even if there were like other lines or less, she would come over and wait in my line. And of course, the daughters would come. And then I'd get a chance to engage with the daughters. And so that's how I, I made the first connection with, with my wife. Uh, and I, and I, don't, I don't think this is in anything, but uh, my wife was in the fifth grade when I was in the sixth grade at the same elementary school. We didn't, I didn't know her then. I, I was big man on campus because I was in the sixth grade. <laughs> she was just in the fifth. Uh, and then when I moved to the seventh, we moved to, to a same area but a different school. There's a brand new school, a growing area. And then we met up again and um, going to church together. But it's through the grocery store. Mm -hmm. It's through befriending the mother and developing a relationship with the mother who brought the daughters that I had a chance to get to know the you daughters. You were enterprising in business and you were very strategic. I yes. like that. And it, it, it was it was a good deal. Forty forty nine years this yeah. this year. Forty nine. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. So my last question is along those lines, Paul. Is because um, I knew you. I, I I had thought it was forty seven years, but now it's forty nine. Maybe yeah. So, give us some lessons in a successful long marriage for people out there. Yeah, the, the, the first thing is... So maybe no I should talk answer. to your wife. No, yeah, there, yeah there, there's definitely no magic answer. Uh, it, I, I, lo I love the, the expression of uh, prayer, patience, and Prozac. You know, so... <laughs> so, so Heavy on the Prozac. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. Prozac. It had a lot of prayer. Uh, both sides, you know, both sides. You know, it's, it's definitely, you know, give and take, 100%, 100%. Uh, it, you know, I think... I have come up with another response to that is okay. I think it's willing I, there, there are two I think it's willing to want to be in the relationship and again that goes back to marketing you know is is the consumer the donor the the, the members member or the constituent the advocate are they willing to be with you can you create a climate that they're willing to be with and so I think I think that's it there um, it's one of the movie stars parents said this and I love this I think that's very true um, when when she uh, Pat, uh, Paltrow, Gwyneth Paltrow, Gwyneth Paltrow okay. her, her parents and and she asked how long how they stayed together and I think the dad said because neither one of us were stupid at the same time and and that's that's really a good thing and I think that's another part of marriage is we we both have not been stupid at the same time <laughs> that's great. 
Paul, thank you. I really appreciate this. Everyone oh. should check out binghamagency.com. Check it out. And it's been an absolute honor, Paul. Thank, thank you, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out.